Hello, listeners. This is a reminder about Luke's English Podcast Premium, which is my other podcast service. With episodes of LEP Premium, I focus specifically on language, helping you understand, remember, and pronounce target vocab and grammar. I'm currently still deep into Premium Series 24. I recently uploaded Part 10. It's all about homophones, but also you can access an archive of over 80 episodes now both audio and video, all about teaching you the kind of English that I speak. And there are plenty of stupid improvisations and jokes and things too. You can get started by going to teacherluke.co.uk slash premium info. You're listening to Luke's English Podcast. For more information, visit teacherluke.co.uk. Hello and welcome back to Luke's English Podcast, this award-winning podcast for learners of English. Yes, the podcast has won a few awards over the years, but not lately. The last few years have been a bit quiet on the award front. I just don't know of any awards going around. If you see any competitions for things like, like best podcast for learners of English or something, let me know because I would like to enter Luke's English Podcast into something like that again. It's been a while. Speaking of competitions, right, I've been thinking of launching another listener competition, um, and I'm wondering what you think. These are those competitions that um, involve the listeners sending in recordings and people voting. Okay, so I've been thinking about a new one. I'm just wondering what you think. The competition this time would involve you recording yourself speaking for, for maybe a minute or two, and sending it into the podcast, and then people, and then I could play those recordings, and then people would vote for their favourite, and that person would then get interviewed in a full episode of the podcast. So this idea, I mean, it's I've done a similar thing in the past, but this idea was sent to me some time ago now by a listener called Vadim. So what do you think about this, listeners? I haven't fully decided to do it yet. So let me know what you think of this new competition idea from Vadim. But anyway, what about this episode then? Well, as promised, this episode features my dad, which should be good news for all of the Rick Thompson fans out there. As you might know, we sometimes call my dad Rickipedia because he knows so much stuff about so many things, although sometimes it might be a bit unreliable from time to time. People often say that my dad should start his own podcast as his episodes are so popular. Well, he still hasn't created a podcast of his own, but I am glad to say that he's written a book. The book is called Park Life, A Year in the Wildlife of an Urban Park. And uh, the book is available for you to read. Um, You can find it now on Amazon and also bookdepository.com. That's B O O K. D-E-P-O-S-I-T-O-R-Y, bookdepository.com. You can get free shipping from Book Depository as well. So, yes, my dad's written a book. It's, it's called Park Life. It's about, yes, a year in the wildlife of an urban park. So in this episode, I'm going to talk to my dad about this book that he's written, including the broader discussion of urban parks in the UK, green public spaces which perform an increasingly important role in UK life. So we start by talking about the book, what it's about, how he was inspired to write it, and what style it's written in. Then we move on to describe some of the wildlife that you can find in a local English urban park. Then we discuss some history of urban parks and the health benefits of spending time in green spaces. Also, there are some collective nouns for different animals, including things like a murder of crows. Did you know this, listeners, about collective nouns for animals? Some of you will be aware of this interesting corner of the English language, but um, when you're describing groups of certain animals, we use these very odd, very weird, colourful words. So if you're talking about a group of crows, and crows are large black birds, you don't just say a group of crows or a flock of crows. You actually talk about a, is, what is it, a, a murder of crows, and if you're talking about ravens, which are similar to crows, but even bigger, uh, it's, a, it's an unkindness of ravens. Very obscure and funny language. So keep listening to hear some more of those. There are some in the conversation, and then I do a few at the end as well. So I hope you enjoy this conversation, 
and I'll chat with you a bit afterwards, including some more collective nouns and stuff. But now, here is Rick Thompson talking about his new book, and here we go. Hello, Dad. Welcome back onto the podcast. How are you today? Hello, Luke. I'm fine. How are you? Very well, thank you. Uh, good. What's, what's going on? What's, uh, what's, what's the situation today? The situation here in England is that uh, you always like the weather, don't you? So the weather yeah. is um, is mixed. Uh, we're getting the typically British weather of um, bands of rain coming in across the Atlantic and producing, you know, showers. So it's a bit sunshine and showers and a bit grey at the moment, quite cool. But it's not too bad. And um, next week, apparently, it's going to be much calmer and, and a bit sunnier. So it, we can't complain. Nice autumnal weather, a little bit little bit chilly, and the trees are starting to turn brown. Autumnal, what a lovely word. Mm. Um, okay, so you're back on the podcast, but this is not an episode of the Rick Thompson Report. But you do have something to report. Yes, no politics this time. Everybody will be glad to know. <laughs> Probably heard too much about what's going on. Yes, you invited me on, Luke, very kindly, uh, to talk about my new book, which has nothing to do with politics. It's um, it's about uh, a lifelong interest in, in wildlife. And uh, my book has just come out and, of course, selling fantastically well because it's so beautiful. A uh, big plug here on the podcast, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> well, yeah, my dad's written a book. And so he's going to tell us all about it. When did you write this book then? And how did well, you Well, I started... It? It's not what they call a lockdown book. Apparently, oh, there really? are hundreds and thousands of books have been written during lockdown, and the publishers are overwhelmed with them. This is not a lockdown book. I, w- I was planning it um, over the last well, two years, really. Mm. And I started, you know, making notes and, and started writing it uh, at the end of last year. And then the lockdown came along and gave me more time to finish it so uh, uh it was quite handy it's called park life park life is the name of a hit song by blur isn't park, it park life yeah <laughs> yeah it's your era is, is it 80s it's, it's 90s it's brit pop 90s uh park right. life yeah was a song by blur park life confidence is a preference for the habitual voyeur of what is known as park life <laughs> it's a stupid song but it was a huge hit uh in i think 1995 but anyway yeah so of course james and i when when you talk about the book park life we always go park life park life I feed the pigeons, I sometimes feed the sparrows too. It gives me a sense of enormous well-being. But it's nothing It's nothing to do with Blur. Nothing to do with Blur, though I did note that there is um, a, a line in their lyrics that says it gives me a sense of enormous well-being. And that was absolutely appropriate, and it is in the front of the book. Because this is a celebration of an urban park. It is basically about the wildlife through the year, a calendar through the year, uh, of the changing seasons and the changing wildlife through a large park, which is just 10 minutes walk away from where I live. And um, it also goes off on little tangents about science, natural history, legends and folklore about some of the species, uh, a little bit of science and a little bit of reflection on other things like, um, you know, the, the health benefits of uh, having regular walks in a natural environment. In a bookshop, which category would this go into? I think it would go into natural history, really. Uh, it's more about wildlife than uh, sociological stuff. But um, it, it does contain a few little uh, reflections on urban living uh, and ends up, of course, by looking at the, the effects of the coronavirus crisis and the fact that suddenly people realised how important um, parks were. Certainly in this country, for a while, we were told we couldn't go out of our houses except for one hour a day exercise. And people obviously used their local parks a lot. Um, in, in London, certainly, lots of people were jogging or walking around their parks uh, just to get a bit of fresh air and, and also to um, uh, exercise. And, and it brought into sharp focus the fact that we don't really appreciate the nature on our doorsteps. The coronavirus crisis, of course, meant everything went completely quiet. Don't know what it was like in other countries, but here, everybody stayed in. There were no cars, traffic stopped, no aeroplanes in the sky at all, no noise. And it was a beautiful spring, beautiful spring weather. 
And so everybody started noticing that the bird song was incredibly loud and they wanted to know what they were. And, and newspapers got full of um, guides to the birds in your garden and, and, and things like that. Uh, and everybody commented on how pleasant it was to be able to hear the, the birds for the first time. And, of course, the air was cleaner. So it was quite interesting that people were drawn towards nature during this period. Mm. Okay, and so um, you, so you started writing this about eighteen months ago, is that right? Yes, I started making my notes in January last year, and it goes through January all the way through to December. So the book starts in the cold. Actually, it doesn't start that way. It starts by recounting when uh, when we moved from the countryside to the town. Yeah, um, we you know from the, you know very well yeah. that we were we lived for twenty six years uh, overlooking. The fields of Warwickshire, um, with a beautiful lane with uh, lots of wildlife up it, and I used to walk up and down the lane in the mornings, uh, noticing the birds and the flowers and the insects and everything. And I thought, well, moving into the middle of town, I'd rather miss that. But in fact, this park, which is called St Nicholas Park, was a revelation. Amazing that it had so many different species, and um, and uh, so I started making notes of them, and it turned into this sort of come with me through St. Nicholas Park through the year, but also with various reflections on, on nature. Exactly. The, the, from I only got my hands on a copy recently, but to what I've read so far, I would say that it is a mix of yeah natural history, meaning the stuff about nature and, and birds and so on, but there's a lot more in there too. So there's bits of sort of so, social... What social science, sociology, yeah. social history, some bits of sort of you know human history, not just natural history, uh, talking about, for example, the establishment of the city and various other things like that. So it's a, a mix of important themes and this narrative of visiting the park every day throughout the year. That's right. It's also even little bits of poetry in there. Uh, so it's a little bit of a mix up. What's the, what kind of style is it written in? Well, it's definitely a conversational style. I mean, I've worked in broadcast news uh, rather than newspapers all my life, and so I'm very used to writing the way you speak. And I can't really stop doing that, but I think people quite like it. Uh, so, you know, you don't write, I, I cannot go out today. Mm. You write, I can't go out today because that's what people say. And mm -hmm. I've always felt that, you know, reading is easier if you read it the way you would hear it. Yes, that's very good as well for my listeners because they're basically going to be getting well if they if they choose to read this book. Oh, I don't know the book, whether they'll be interested or just, not. Just assumed there for a second there, didn't I? That they'd actually bother to to make a purchase. But uh, uh, but anyway, plain English, yes, written in the sort of style that you would speak in, which is uh, the sort of thing we we want. Yes, as, I think uh, that as that learners it's easier to read, easier to read mm. that way. So I was going to ask you. Uh, we're going to talk about parks and some history and stuff in a moment. But before we do that, I mean, you've, you were basically inspired to write this from your experiences of walking around the park um, and discovering this sort of bit of nature in the middle of the town. And you, you go for a walk around the park pretty much every morning. Is that right? Yes, that's right. Yeah. OK. How long does it take? Um, it takes just over an hour normally to go from here all, all around yeah. the park, stop and look and listen for a bit and then come back. So it's about an hour each morning. Warwick is is the county town of Warwickshire. It's quite compact. It used to be a, a medieval walled town. Obviously, the, the walls aren't really there anymore, and it's spread out beyond the walls. But it's still not a huge city. But it is um, it is very fortunate in that it does have two quite large parks. Uh, one of them, kind of at the top of the hill in Warwick, is called Priory Park because it was the grounds of a Dominican priory. Mm. And uh, if people know their their British history, they'll know that Henry VIII, uh, when he separated from the Church of Rome, grabbed all the wealth that the church had and the monasteries. They called it the dissolution of the monasteries. And the Priory in Warwick uh, was um, dissolved in, at that time. In fact, it's, it's quite funny. Um, Years later, a rich American businessman decided to buy the Priory, mm -hmm. which was falling into disrepair. 
and he he bought it and dismantled it stone by stone. Yeah, and it was shipped across to America and rebuilt as his home in Virginia. What? And it's it's still there. Warwick Priory is this splendid house in Virginia. There's some guy in Virginia. Says, I want to. I want to buy a. <laughs> Like, I so want a priory. Actually, yeah, I want me a priory. <laughs> so he actually bought the priory and had it shipped over and then yeah, re- that's right. rebuilt. That's such a weird that thing to do. That was in the do. late 18th century. So, um, so the park is just the grounds of the priory and it's very rough. This is Priory Park and it has, you know, bits of woodland, trees, uh, open areas of rough grass and it's favourite for dog walkers. The dogs love it because it's full of squirrels and rabbits. Um, yeah, I like I like, other, I like Priory Park. I took yeah. uh, my daughter for walks there. She likes running around searching for rabbits. But uh, you prefer St Nick's? Well, St Nicholas is the main park in the middle of Warwick. It's called St Nicholas Park because it's next to St Nicholas Church. St Nicholas Church was the church that the earls of Warwick, who lived in Warwick Castle, went to, or at least their servants did. Mm-hmm. And um, it's right next to Warwick Castle. And it's also next to the river. Now, this is quite important because I think parks that have got water are much more interesting than ones that don't. Mm. Um, and I mentioned Central Park in New York. They made sure it had lakes and streams fed into it so they would have plenty of water. Good for wildlife, also interesting look to look at landscapes, but it does attract birds and insects and, and interesting plants. So... The, prior, the the park we're talking about, St. Nicholas Park, mm-hmm. runs alongside the River Avon. The River Avon is the Warwickshire Avon, right yeah. in the middle of England, and it goes into the biggest river we've got, River Seven, and runs into the sea near Bristol. Uh, quite interesting that as well, because Avon, um, there's lots of River Avons in Britain. Uh, there are five River Avons in England. Mm. There are three River Avons in Scotland. And there's one River Avon in Wales. Bloody hell. So um, you might say, well, why is that? Well, it's quite fun, really. The the um, the reason is that Afon, Avon is the Welsh or Celtic word for river. Mm. So you can imagine the invading Romans coming along and saying to the local Celts, what's that called? And they say, Avon. And they say, right, lads, it's the River Avon. But right. actually, it means the River River. <laughs> so okay. um, it's alongside the Warwickshire Raven, and um, that makes it particularly good for wildlife. Um, I can describe to you, if like, yeah. you, you walk into the park, and it's a terrific recreational facility. Grown up over the years, it, it started in the 19th century and, and then developed after the Second World War. So it's got a children's playground. It's got a, a fun fair, a little fun fair. It's got tennis courts, football fields, uh, skate, even a paddling pool. Skate park? It did have a skate park. Don't think I that's don't there anymore. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And now they've got a gym and a, a, a sports centre. So, you know, there's all that stuff. Mm. But if you walk, walk on... I walk past it, and this is an area of nearly 100 acres. Um, you walk up along the river path, and it goes wilder. And there's a copse of trees, interesting trees, leaning over the river, mounds of, of bushes and scrub and things. And then there are some fishing pools. The fishing pools are really good because they've got uh, reed bed and, and rushes and, and all sorts of interesting plants around them and places for the wildlife to hide. And then beyond that, there's a whole load of rough ground, which hasn't been tended for a long time, which is great for wildlife. And so when you're walking around the park, uh, what kind of wildlife are you identifying and how are you identifying it? Well, as you well know, I've been interested in birds all my life, ever since I was little. I don't really know why, I just got interested. And of course, after many, many years of watching and listening and identifying, you get to know them. And... Um, and bird watching is often bird listening first. Mm. You tend to hear them first. Sometimes you only hear them. And after a while, you get to know what's what. Um, but also, I'm interested in insects and dragonflies, butterflies, plants, and everything else. So in the, in the park, there's some birds that are obvious, and you know you're going to see them. And on the cover of the book, there is a magpie. Yes. Um, magpie is not a popular bird. Uh, people don't like the way it, it kind of eats other birds' eggs and, and young birds in their garden. 
Yeah, and, they and steal it makes things. chattering noise. It's actually got a lot of legend attached to it. The magpie, incidentally, the bank magpies um, are a, 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 a um, what's the it's corvid, right? Um, yes, that's right. Or the crow family, a corvid. Yes, it's quite a large bird, uh, a bit like a blackbird, but uh, it's got a longer tail and uh, white flashes on its wings, on its butt. On yes, it. it does. It has a long tail, black and white. Yeah. Uh, the European magpie is very common. It's common in parks. The Americans have got a different kind of magpie. Um, but it's the same same family. They're known for um, they're known for stealing things like shiny things. They are the thieving magpie. It was a Rossini opera, wasn't it? Right, a perfect story where the 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 maid is accused of stealing silver, silver spoon, and things, and she was actually executed because no one else had access to her lady's room. So it must have been her. But it turns out it was a magpie coming in through the window. Oh dear! They do they do decorate their nests with with pretty things. Yeah. Uh, often it's silver paper, sweet wrappers, things yeah. like that, yeah. and yeah. bits of of you know coloured string. Okay. Um, I don't know whether they really steal people's diamond rings or not, but uh, anyway, yeah. they're regarded as bad birds. They they are thieves. They are um, uh, gossips in legend. But this is one of the birds, the first birds that you might come across when you go oh, into the yeah, park. Oh, yeah, you're certain, certain to see magpies in the park, along with the big wood pigeons. Yeah. And uh, common little birds like robins uh, and blackbirds. You're sure, sure to see them. And, of course, on the river there will be ducks and swans. You're almost certain to see them. But um, there are many, many less obvious birds, especially at different times of the year. Uh, the migrants will start arriving in March and April from a lo- huge distances and at this time of year we're coming into autumn now in the northern hemisphere a lot of the birds uh, move off they go back to warmer climes down mm-hmm. south mm-hmm. and we get a lot of birds coming in from scandinavia eastern europe uh, to escape the very severe cold they're going to get there so what are the sort of uh, more interesting birds that you can come across then on a walk around the park what are the lesser known birds or fav- favorite birds of yours that you sometimes see i was very very pleased to discover a little warbler uh, on one of my first walks around mm-hmm. the warbler family are these very small normally brown birds uh, and most of them migrate quite long distances for tiny birds some of them migrate from south africa and wow. Namibia and places like that come yeah. uh, up to Britain for the summer. Um, yes, they, I, I was walking around the pools and heard this sharp chip, and, and I thought, hello, hello. Um, that's not the sound of any common bird. Mm-hmm. It's a particularly loud chip. Yeah. And I'd heard it before, and so I went looking for it, and sure enough, it was what's called a Chetty's Warbler. Mm. C-E-T-T-I. Chetty's Warbler named after the person who first identified it, who was called Mr. Chetty. Dave Chetty. I think he was an, I think Dave Chetty. I think he may have been Italian. Anyway, okay. um, that was really good because until recently, they, they've only been confined to the south of Britain, along the south coast and, and you know, east, southeast. So it's good to have a Chetty's Warbler, and they yeah. don't migrate. They, they, it's a sign of climate change that we, our winters are getting milder and milder. We hardly ever get really severe winters these days. And so they can stay all year round, find their insects and little invertebrates. And so we had Chetty's warblers in the park. Really good. Very nice. A uh, more spectacular one uh, was um, uh, a great white egret. Whoa, what's that? What did that this look? Is, it's a big white heron. Mm. And they are rare in this country. These are the ones um, that sit right next to the water. They've got a very long neck and a very long beak. And they sit next to the water and they watch very carefully. These are herons, but uh, egrets are kind of yes, the, the same, same family. family. And then when they see a fish, they you know wait and then bam strike and get the fish out of the water uh so that's a heron or an egret so uh, uh, what was the one a great white egret great white egret you see again it's a, a sign of of um milder weather in the winter mm-hmm. here um the the heron family in this country was confined really to the gray heron which is relatively common and uh, and the bittern which is a brown job that hides in the reeds but the egrets have been moving in in recent years. The one that I expected to find in the park is called the little egret. 
because they really have spread from the south very quickly and they're all over the shop, but we haven't seen one in our park yet. I think they're rather shy and they mm. don't like people. Mm -hmm. So I was really surprised when this great big white bird came floating high above the river past the walls of Warwick Castle. I thought, oh, a heron. And then I thought, wait a minute, <laughs> it's <laughs> white. And it came past me with its very long legs and uh, beating into the wind, so it's quite slow. I could have a good look at it. Yeah. And I think that it's only there's only a couple of great white uh, egrets that have been seen in Warwickshire so far. Uh -huh. So it's a real rarity to see in the middle of town. Yeah. Mm. Is it just birds or are there other things too? No, there's plenty of other things. Um, the... Uh, the dragonflies are interesting, but I find them rather difficult. I mean, dragonflies don't hang around. They, they, they zip past and uh, don't settle very often. Um, and so it's difficult to identify them, but it is a bit of a challenge. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're, they're great. Uh, again, some of them migrate. These dragonflies really? come in for the summer. Yeah. Well, they fly across, across continental sea. Europe. Yep. They fly across the channel. Wow. Uh, and so do butterflies. We get migrating butterflies. Yeah. There's one called a painted lady, which is particularly pretty butterfly, black, white, and orangey wings. And every now and then, every decade, really, Britain has a painted lady year when millions of them arrive because yeah. the weather conditions are just right. It needs a, a, a southerly wind for some time, warm southerly wind, and they kind of ride on that and come in in huge numbers. Well, last year was a painted lady year. Ah. Um, uh, record numbers were recorded and so when I first saw one in the park I thought whoa a painted lady it's flown all the way in from Italy or Spain or somewhere mm -hmm. and then of course they started turning up everywhere uh, so um, it, insects are interesting uh, and so are plants and uh, so are the, the mammals it's great uh, so tell us about then parks then urban parks in the UK what's the story then what's the what's the history well, I'm a big fan of, of parks, uh, urban parks in particular. Um, the, basically, they were, um, they were developed ac across the world, really, uh, in the mid 1800s. Uh, if you take Central Park in New York, that's an interesting story. Mm -hmm. Um, the, the, the New York State passed, passed a law in, uh, I think 1853. Um, to set aside more than 750 acres of land, a huge chunk of land on Manhattan, mm. to create Air America's first landscaped public park. And uh, they, they had a competition to see who was going to design it. Now, I think this is pretty enlightened. Um, this chunk of land it must be worth zillions as real estate. Yeah. Uh, but what a valuable facility it is for the people in New York and, and much loved. Mm. So the competition was won by um, uh, a journalist and an agriculturalist, a, a British-born architect as well in this consortium. And they, um, they, they designed Central Park so that it would have lots and lots of different interesting features with streams and rocks and caves and grottos and uh, woodland and all that kind of stuff mm. trying to make sure it wasn't just a grid because it is just a great block in the middle of manhattan yeah but it's um a, a terrific facility and they modeled their park on on several european parks in particular the one near liverpool in birkenhead Mm. Um, they studied that and and uh, so a lot of cities have got parks some are more fortunate than others you live in Paris and of course it's got some big open space by the river the Tuileries and, and Jardin de Luxembourg and places like that but London has got many more green spaces than, than that it, yeah, it um, does. it's got a huge Hyde Park it's got uh, Regent's Park and many, many smaller parks all dotted around. And I'm a big fan of them. It, it's interesting that um, there's been a lot of research studies into, is it really true that uh, contact with nature um, does you good? Because we know, you know, it, it uplifts the spirits and makes you, cheers you up. Mm. But did it, is it good for health? There was a big study actually last year pulling together all the studies they could find in the world about this. 
And the conclusions were absolute, that people who walk regularly in contact with nature are healthier, they have uh, less um, diabetes, less um, heart attack, mm. le- lower cholesterol, they have less mental issue, fewer mental issues. Yeah. It is absolutely proven that it's good for you to be in contact with what's called green space. Have you four f- out of five of us in the world live in cities and towns, and, and uh, so it's quite important to keep, keep in touch with the natural world. Have you found that spending time in the park has been sort of good for you? Definitely. Definitely. I mean, especially when, when we have some stressful things going on, the coronavirus crisis in particular – But before that, we've been worrying about Brexit here, which, uh, of course, is Mm -hmm. upsetting. And I get rather exercised about um, some of the the untruths we're being told by our politicians. And I wake up in the morning feeling angry. Mm. Well, if I have a wander around the park and I watch a kingfisher for a little while, beautiful bird, or I find something unusual... It cheers me up no end. And and I like the changing weather. I like the change of the seasons. I like it when it's cold. I like it when it's hot. I like it when it's windy. I even like it when it's raining. Nice. Have you noticed any changes in the park uh, as um, climate, climate change does its thing? Oh, yes, definitely. I mean, I mentioned that some of the birds are moving from breeding in the south up into what's called the Midlands here in the middle of the country. We're also getting invasive species. This is not particularly welcome. Species that quite like more wet and warm climates invading. We we have something called Himalayan balsam, which is a real pest. What is it? It's a very beautiful, tall plant with purple and white flowers hanging down, which look a little bit like um, orchids. Okay. Um, and it was introduced to some stately homes last century, and it has spread. And it is um, flourishing in the warmer, wetter climate um, and without any harsh winters. And it grows very high, and it, it, and it attracts all the bees and the flies and the pollinators, and the other plants miss out, uh. and it overwhelms them, and it, particularly along riverbanks. Mm. It, it has seed pods. And when they're ready, they fire these seeds into the water, pop, pop. Uh, And then they flow down the river. And these, you know, the Himalayan balsam is there for all the way down the riverbanks. Yeah. Uh, They're a bit like triffids. Yeah. Uh, (laughs) Triffids. Oh, that's fantastic. Triffids, listeners. um, Well, there's an English science fiction writer. This is a tangent. But there's an English science fiction writer called John Wyndham. That's it. He was born just up the road from here. That's right. There's In Knoll. Yeah. Isn't there a place called the Wyndham Estate? What am I thinking of? I'm not sure. I don't think that's him. Anyway, John, Wynd- another one. John Wyndham was born nearby, and um, he wrote a really, really great uh, sort of science fiction horror f- uh, story about these plants, these carnivorous plants called triffids, and they're really big, and they're actually from outer space. They are. They're absolute aliens. Uh, should we do the b- brief synopsis of the story? <laughs> basically, yeah. basically the it's plant- a famous book. I mean, some people listening to this may have read the Day of the Triffids. It's been translated into lots of different languages. It needs to be. It needs to be uh, made into a really good film or a series again. It was a series on TV in the, in the olden days. But um, so these huge trees, not trees, these huge plants. Let, let, let me let me start off the beginning before we get to the huge plants. Okay. What happens is that uh, there's meteorites, a huge shower of meteorites in the sky, and the lights are amazing, and they go on for several nights, and the, the you know everyone watches this light display. The scientists aren't quite sure what it is, but they think it's a meteor shower, and of coloured lights in the sky every night. But then uh, everybody goes blind. Mm-hmm. So the, everybody who's seen these things goes blind. And our hero has been in hospital having an operation on his eyes and his eyes have been bandaged up and he's missed this light show. So when he finally takes his bandages off and the world is completely silent and there's no vehicles and there's no nothing, he discovers the world is populated by people who are all blind. Mm -hmm. And it becomes a horror story, as you say, say, 
Um, and then the Triffids start taking over because the, the, the Triffids have been planted by these things that came in from outer space. And they are going to take it. But you know what? The Triffids, I remember in the story, have been around for several decades. Or well, they've been yeah. around for a while at the beginning of the story. And and people are cultivating them because you can use them to get oil. Oh, that's right. They have right? oil, so they have Triffid farms. They're already, the Triffids are already installed. They're f- being farmed by people to extract the oil. Uh, they do have, they're tall. They're probably nine foot tall or something like that. And they look like a sort of a daffodil, but like a horrible one. And they've got these uh, seed pods on the, against the sides of the the plant. And um, they have uh, a poisoned poisoned thing on the end of a long long sort of tendril, like, which lashes at your eyes. Yeah, buried deep inside the uh, the the flower, there's a long stamen or something which can come whipping out. And on the end, there's a poisonous pad on the end of it, and it come it comes back in so it's it's very very dangerous and it can hurt people and the and anyway uh they people I think learn, that's enough uh, people would don't want to know what happened but yeah then then there's the meteor shower and everyone's like wow look at that it's beautiful but there's this one guy who's in hospital uh having eye surgery and when he wakes up several weeks later or something when he takes the bandages off everyone is blind and then the triffids come in uh because it's all been part of the plan and uh it's a kind of end of the world sort of zombie apocalypse but with triffids and it's really really good Anyway, anyway, we don't have triffids in St. Nicholas Park, um, but we do have other invasive species, the Himalayan balsam. And also there's a thing called orange balsam, which comes from North America, actually, which is uh, it's known as touch me not. Touch me not, because if you touch it, it can give you a very nasty rash. Ah. Um, uh, so there's all, there's all sorts of changes with uh, with climate change. Obviously, the the um the impact of 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 global heating are going to be he- he- felt much more in in tropical and pacific countries uh, i was listening to a talk uh, only this week with a top british climate scientist and he was explaining how we are still on course to have a 2 degree rise in 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 average temperatures 2 degrees celsius rise within a short period of time really mm-hmm. and that the ice sheets are melting faster than people expected and the um it's going to have extreme storms and we can have extreme weather events in various parts of the world which we are already experiencing and increased drought areas and maybe water shortages in areas that can't cultivate land anymore and all these things are actually happening so um here in Britain, it may not have the kind of impacts it might have in a place like Bangladesh if the water rises by you know half a meter it 's got a big impact there yeah uh, but it, it, even here we can see that see that everything's starting earlier in the season because the winter isn't isn 't all that bad the, the The birds are nesting earlier uh, the migrants <laughs> from the south are arriving earlier. Mm. Um, and uh, some species are flourishing because they like the warmer and wetter weather. Others are not, um, particularly the seabirds. We we have a lot of seabirds around our coasts, and a lot of them feed on fish in the North Sea, and uh, the water is just marginally warmer than it was. I mean, almost undetectable, but the fish are very sensitive, and they've moved north. So the birds got to go further and further and further to get the fish. And yeah. um, puffins and, and guillemots are declining for that reason. Yeah, yeah. Hmm, so that's a sad end to the uh, conversation. Well, it is a bit sad. Uh, the book is not sad. It's a celebration of park, celebration of contact with nature. And um, I, I hope uh, you know, people enjoy it. So how do you write a book then? How do you do that? Well, you have to have an idea. Yeah. And you have to want to. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Was it difficult? Um, not when I get going. No, no. I, I, it came together quite nicely, and and um, I enjoyed researching some of the legends mm-hmm. about, particularly about birds. Um, you know, like today uh, on my walk, I heard um, some ravens flying over. These are very, very large crows. Ravens. People will know about ravens. And they, you hear them because they have this croak, 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 croak that 
carries long distances. Yeah. And it's nice in the centre of town to hear a raven because, you know, in the past I'd only hear them in the mountains of Scotland or Wales. Uh, mm. The ravens um, are spreading uh, in from these areas, though they don't they, – they fly over here. They're kind of always on important business. They're not going to stop. Right. Uh, but the legends about ravens are, of course, uh, Norse, you know, Scandinavian. They, they – Odin, um, top god, had uh, – Thor's, Thor's dad – yeah, had two two ravens uh, accompanying him all the time. Um, I can't remember their names. Munin, they're called... Uh, Odin's ravens. Ravens. Let's um, see. One, one is, Hugin one is, and Munin. Thank you. One is called... One is uh, the, interested in, in memory. The other one is in... Thought, thought, and memory is That's what right. they were representing. Hugin is, and is they were thought. his messengers. They would fly around the world and bring back messages about what was going on. So his, his eyes and ears were these ravens, but the ravens are in in general legend thought to be unlucky. Do you know that that there are collective nouns for? Oh yeah, nearly all birds and animals. And animals, yeah. Collective nouns. Collective nouns for, for ravens. For ravens. It's, isn't it a murder of ravens? No, it's a murder of crows. Okay. It's a murder of crows. And I think you'll find that it's an unkindness of ravens. Okay. Oh, an an is it really? An unkindness yeah. of an ravens. An unkindness of ravens. They are, they are bad news, ravens. I think it may be because um, they would feed on the corpses after a battle. And it is said that ravens would follow armies marching. Yeah. They would fly overhead. I think Tolkien uses that in The Lord of the Rings. I think he has, he has some evil uh, messengers of Sauron mm. uh, spying on the army flying over. Yeah. yeah. Um, oh, quickly, yeah, before so we move on, Dad, let's, let's do a little bit of uh, animal collective noun uh, um, Q&A. Okay. So, um, can you tell me what the collective noun is? So, yeah, as we've established, it's like, what's the most common collective noun? Like a flock of sheep? Yeah, flock yeah, of a sheep. Flock of sheep. Flock of, flock of seagulls. Flock of seagulls. Flock uh, of birds. A flock of birds. A, a shoal of fish. Yeah. Something like that. These are common words. But for every different animal, listeners, that we have, we have different uh, group names or different collective nouns and they're very weird and funny in some cases alligators dad do you know what we, we oh not a clue it's what's a, a group of alligators a congregation of an- alligators really that isn't a congregation in church when, when well, people go to so. church isn't that the congregation well maybe that's because you maybe know, they're very religious when, alligators when they all get together it looks like a bunch of um uh benches in a church maybe well maybe um mm-hmm. uh, apes apes there's oh, two possible words know. it could be a shrewdness of apes or mm-hmm. a troop of apes let's let's oh, get a troop of apes i've heard of troop of baboons troop of apes yeah but a, but a shrewdness mm. Mm. um let's that means they're thinking very carefully yeah i'm going to see if i can find one that is i got one for for goldfinches people in europe in particular will know the goldfinch one of the most colorful little birds we've got yeah it was a very popular cage bird for many years uh-huh. um you know uh, like a canary or a budgie but th- before these exotic birds came on ships from far away they caught goldfinches they sing a lot they twitter a lot and they're very very colorful and beautiful and the name comes from a big bright gold bar on its wing yeah well the goldfinch uh it, group is called a charm a charm of goldfinches how lovely Yes. What about a, uh, do you know what, uh, camels, do you know what we say for camels? Oh dear. Hmm. I don't know. Imagine a, a li- imagine a line of them walking across the desert. A hump of camels. A caravan of caravan, a caravan oh, of camels. Oh yes, of course. I'm going to ask you a couple of others. Oh God, this is funny. So a, a, a group of wild cats is called a destruction of cats. Oh really? Isn't that good? I've got some yes. others. I I'm sure I'll find some common ones that you'll that you'll know. Yeah, a murder of crows. Um let's see. Hold on. Dolphins, do you know what we call pod? A pod, yeah. Like a a, a dolphin pod. Um Yes. Uh, peas grow in a pod. Peas. It's kind of like a shell. Uh elephants. Oh, uh, I, th- I ought to know this. 
Well, there's, there's the the one which is fairly well known, which is herd, a herd of elephants. But oh, there's yeah. another one. What what are elephants associated with having? Good memories. Yeah, so it's a memory of elephants. A, a memory of elephants. Yeah, a, 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 a mob of emus, a charm of finches, a, a flamboyance of flamingos, <laughs> a, tower like of, a tower of giraffes, um, and so on and so on. The list goes on and on and on. It's, yes. it's great, isn't it? Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, where were we? Well, anyway. Well, I think we, we just about explained why I wrote the book about uh, a walk in the park through the year, through the seasons, identifying things, and um, with a little bit of legend, a little bit of folklore, a little bit of science, uh, and uh, it's it's called Park Life. It, how do you, people can get it on Amazon or wherever around the world. It only costs a tenner, as we say, ten pounds. So yes, Amazon dot whatever, Amazon dot com, Amazon dot whatever your country is, and then just search for Park Life, Rick Thompson, and you should find it. it it's, well it's also available on that other place. What's the other website? The book, oh, depository. The book depository. Book depository. I think is actually owned by Amazon. I, uh, is it? It's certainly got some kind of connection. Anyway, Book Depository is good because it has free worldwide delivery and everything. Bookdepository.com, uh, Park Life, Rick Thompson, free worldwide delivery. Not bad. Dad, thanks a lot for coming on the podcast and well That's done. All right. For- well, thank you for, for asking about my book. Um, if anybody does get it, I hope they enjoy it. It should be easy to read. And I think that the, um, I hope that the species, all these unfamiliar words of, of European species, um, don't put people off because they're they're interesting words i forgot to add actually that the book is full of illustrations done by you so you, lots of drawings of these birds well not all that many i've got a, i've got a drawing for each chapter yeah uh, to introduce it a um, little pen and ink sketch another thing i do luke is pen and ink sketches yes you're, you're an artist and an illustrator as well and uh, people can see your illustrations of the birds uh, yeah as, as we said in the book which is very nice um, okay, Dad, well, have a nice rest of the day. Well, it was very nice to chat to you. You too. I, I hope everything's all right over there in France. Yep. Um, where, you know, I know you're rather locked down at the moment. Yeah, you know, um, business to an extent. Even. Just const- yeah. constantly wearing a mask and having, an yes. itch, and having an itchy face and not being able to breathe. and not Because being you able- have to wear them all the time, don't you? Whenever, you, whenever I go out, in yeah. Paris, just, just yeah. Just wear them all over the place, everywhere, all the time. Mm. It's a bit of a nightmare. I'm performing uh, stand up on Sunday, oh, and really? I'm wondering how that's going to work. I think we're well, you supposed can't to do it in a mask. No, I don't think so. I've, I, we have to bring our own microphones, so mm. that you know that solves the kind of spitting all over the microphone situation. But I wonder if the audience is going to be all kind of like separated and wearing masks and stuff. Well, it I, might, would, I would hope so. Might be a I, bit I weird. I would think that they that you might be a bit thin. Your audience, they might have to be yeah. sitting. Uh, with a two meter distance or something it's possible they well, may well be wearing masks but obviously you can't i mean you can't do stand up wearing a mask <laughs> i haven't do- i haven't done and made up any material about coronavirus i've got no observations jokes or anything to say about it we'll, uh, we'll see we'll see if i think of something on the spur of the moment on sunday but anyway uh dad have a yes have a nice day and uh, speak to you again soon okay lovely to talk to you and enjoy your stand up at the weekend thank you So thanks again to Dad for being on the podcast today. Once again, check Amazon or Book Depository for Rick Thompson Park Life to pick up a copy of my dad's book for yourself. Um, In fact, the book has already picked up a five-star rating on Amazon from someone called Princess Lizzie Kins. I have no idea who she is, but this is her review. Five stars out of five. She says it's a wonderful read. Uh, This was reviewed in the UK on the 5th of September of this year. What a beautifully and thoughtfully written book. A super balance of content between wildlife and local history, with some lovely poetic references thrown in. This book shows how anyone can escape the haste of urban life and take a moment to look at and love the world around them. 
I live in Warwick, so have the added benefit of knowing the localities mentioned, but would recommend this to absolutely anyone that has an urban park near them and enjoys a damn good read. So, thumbs up for Dad. Nice one. There you go. But we're not done here yet, listeners. I have some more things to do in this episode. First of all, you heard me mention the stand-up comedy gig that I had on Sunday. And I did the gig, and it went fine. It was good. I recorded it as well, so I will play a few minutes of that at the end of the episode. So stick around, and you'll listen to a few minutes of me doing some stand-up material in front of a small crowd of people on Sunday evening. But first, let me uh, go through some more collective nouns for animals. This is a really interesting and curious aspect of English, the way we use different words to collectivize different animals. So you heard us mention some there, and I've included them in this list too. So here is a list of common collective nouns for animals. Not all of them, but I just think probably the more common ones that a lot of people know, or at least the more interesting ones. So whales, you know, these big mammals that live in the sea, right? Um, The largest creatures we have on Earth. Um, it's a school of whales, which I always thought was nice. A school of whales. This one is fantastic. The next one. So starlings. Do you know what starlings are? They're like little black birds. They kind of appear to be black. I think their their feathers are actually kind of kind of shiny. Um, but anyway, they appear to be black. Little black birds, and they um, at certain times of the year they gather together and fly in these huge groups. They look like big clouds of these birds and they fly these clouds fly in these really incredible shapes in the sky it's like these kind of undulating shapes of all these starlings flying together and i think it's something to do with the way they roost when they settle down for the evening sometimes they do these big group flying things and it looks incredible but we call that an a murmuration a murmuration of starlings which is beautiful um a flock of sheep which is something everyone should know it's a very common one Flock is a very common um, collective noun for animals. Um, A nest of rabbits. You sort of imagine them maybe nesting in a little kind of hole in the ground or something. It'd look a big group of them. A nest of rabbits. Uh, Puppies. If your dog has puppies, we say that the dog has had a litter of puppies. Um, Litter. Yes, like the stuff that people might throw on the floor instead of throwing in the litter bin rubbish that's been left on the floor is litter i don't know why we call it a litter of puppies but it still sounds cute pigeons is a flock a flock of pigeons um the next one is lovely so owls you know these birds that come out at night right owls um a parliament of owls which is great which kind of makes them sound like the sort of the politicians of the animal world um a troop of monkeys I think we we'd said a troop of apes before, uh, a troop like a sort of like a small group of soldiers, walking in a line or something. Um, lions, you must know this one for some reason. Everyone seems to know this. It's a pride of lions, pride like you can feel proud of yourself, like that kind of pride. Um, a swarm of insects or flies or bees. Again, another one that everyone should know. A swarm, a swarm of insects. S W A R M. Uh, gulls, these are those white birds that uh, you find at the coast. Uh, we call them gulls. They've got like yellow beaks, yellow bills, yellow feet, uh, but white or grey bodies. Uh, a colony of gulls. You can imagine maybe a rock in the ocean and it's covered with uh, nesting gulls. It does seem to be like a kind of colony. Um, as my dad said earlier, a charm of finches, which is a charming phrase a murder of crows as i mentioned a shrewdness of apes if you're shrewd it means you're very you're you're very good at making exactly the right decision you're very calculating so shrewdness is is the noun for that so it's odd to say a shrewdness of apes i mean are apes particularly calculating and shrewd i always thought that was uh something we um associated with a fox that a fox is cunning and shrewd anyway a shrewdness of apes a pack of dogs Um, An army of frogs, which is quite a frightening prospect. A whole army of frogs. Um, The next one is one of my favourites. An array of hedgehogs. Hedgehogs are these little, cute little creatures that have lots of spikes on them 
all over them. And if they get threatened, they roll into a ball and it's like a ball of spikes. And they're very cute. They live in the English countryside. You find them in your back garden and stuff. So an an array of hedgehogs, A-double-R-A-Y. But this is kind of like a selection. Like if you were to buy, try, you know, if you were going to buy a gun or something, you'd have an array of guns laid out on the table, you know, like a selection of them. So an array, an array of hedgehogs for you to choose from. And um, a mischief of mice. Mischief, like when you're getting up to no good, doing naughty things, that's mischief. So quite appropriate, really, for mice. A mischief of mice. So there you go. I mean, shall I test you on those? Can you remember them? Whales, do you remember? Whales? Whales, it's a, yes, a school of whales. You can imagine all the whales studying down there in the in the sea. Next one is difficult. Starlings all flying in big um, clouds. That's a murmuration. Uh, sheep is easy because it's it's one everyone should know and it's a common one a flock uh, rabbits they're all there in like a little mound uh, lots of little holes in the mound they're all living in there it's a nest of rabbits puppies um, I mean then it's nothing like the rubbish that's left on the floor but it's the same word that's right litter pigeons same old words the the, the, the most common one a flock Owls, they're the politicians of the animal world. Um, that's right, it's a parliament of owls. You can imagine a, a, a line of monkeys uh, marching down some path in the jungle somewhere, um, uh, like a little group of soldiers. That's right, a troop of monkeys. Uh, lions are very proud of themselves. That's right, it's a pride of lions. Um, insects, flies, bees, ah, too many of them. A swarm. Uh, gulls, you know, they've got the, like their own, they've kind of um, occupied a whole rock uh, in the sea and they've kind of set up just like a whole cult there or something, a colony, colony of gulls. Finches are very charming. Yes, it's a charm of finches. Crows, it makes you think of something like Macbeth, the Shakespeare play in which uh, the title character kills a number of people in order to become the, the king. Uh, that's right, killing. You think of murder, a murder of crows, um, a shrewdness of apes. Uh, dogs come in packs. Yeah, packs of three. <laughs> get your dog. Get your dogs in packs down at the supermarket. Um, frogs. There's loads of them, and they've got all got guns. And it's, that's right. It's an army of frogs. Just a selection of hedgehogs. An array of hedgehogs there. And mice, they're always doing naughty things, getting up to no good. That's right. It's a mischief of mice. So there you go. Some collective nouns for animals. That's almost it for this episode then. Don't forget to check out Luke's English Podcast Premium. I just uploaded Premium Part 10 um, yesterday. Teacherluke.co.uk slash premium info. But as promised earlier, now here are a few minutes from my stand-up set on Sunday evening. There was one Lepster in the audience, by the way, who came up to me uh, at the end of the show to say hello. And uh, he'd come because he'd seen the gig advertised on my Facebook page. So if you're ever in Paris and you're up for coming to see a show, check out my Facebook page, facebook.com slash Luke Comedian. Facebook.com slash Luke Comedian comedian that's where i put up my uh, like news of my latest gigs and stuff like that so shout out to that lepster who was there at the show anyway this was my actu- this was actually my first gig since christmas so something like 9 months of of not doing any gigs because of the lockdown and just general busyness but it was great to be back on stage again and i should be doing more gigs this year lockdown permitting so this is me on stage at the new york comedy night in paris last sunday trying out some new material this is just about two or three minutes. The whole set was about nine minutes long, but I'm just giving you a little selection of some of the new bits here. Thanks for listening to my podcast, and I will speak to you again soon. But for now, it's time to say goodbye. Bye, 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 bye. Hello, very nice to be here. My name's Luke, Luke Thompson, uh, for the French people here. I know you, you can't spell my name. French people have trouble with my name. They can't spell it because there's a P. Hello, very nice to be here. My name's Luke. Luke Thompson, uh, for the French people here. I know you, you can't spell my name. French people have trouble with my name. They can't spell it because there's a P. Hide. They don't realise there's a P just hiding in the middle of my name. <laughs> for no reason. <laughs> just hiding between M and S. Like, why are you here? I don't know. <laughs> and 
I am. So I, you know, it's like because it's T H O M P S O N. So I have to explain. You know, it's Thompson with a P. I was in the supermarket the other day. I said to the guy, "It's Thompson with a P," and she wrote Pomson. <laughs> <laughs> so welcome to my life. Yes, Thompson, which actually means Tom's son. Yes, apparently I am Tom's son, which is weird because my dad is called Rick. <laughs> And, the, and he's Tom's son as well. So what is he like, my brother and my dad? <laughs> and the, it, what's even weirder is like, my mum is Tom's son too. <laughs> who the fuck is Tom? <laughs> anyway, who is this Tom? And why has he been having sex with so many people in the family? <laughs> <laughs> who are you, Tom? <laughs> it's nice to be here. Um, you can probably tell from my accent that I am from the past. <laughs> From, from London. But uh, see, the thing is about Paris is like, like architecturally, it's very interesting. I find it, uh, it's obviously beautiful, but I find it very sort of imposing as well. Because, you know, all these very uniform streets, you know, lots of these long boulevards and like very high-fronted terraces and stuff like that. Because it was all designed by one person, basically. The whole thing was just... If, and if you don't... If you live in Paris and you don't get on with that one person, you're screwed, aren't you? <laughs> basically. His name was... Uh, what is it? Baron Usman. Baron Houseman. My, my favourite thing about this guy is his name is Houseman. <laughs> I am Houseman! <laughs> I am Houseman! I build house! <laughs> What do you need? Do you need house? I build house! House man! House man! <laughs> He's like a superhero, like Batman or Spider-Man. House man! This is his superhero strength. <laughs> yeah, house man. Boom, 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 boulevard, house man! <laughs> that's it, that's it, that's my end, that's my time, ladies and gentlemen. You're supposed to make a big laugh. Thanks for listening to Luke's English Podcast. For more information, visit teacherluke.co.uk.